Hello again. Um, it's raining outside, funnily enough, so I thought I'd do a, another quick sort of how-to um, video, or, or perhaps one more accurately, one that answers some questions. Um, there's been a lot of questions coming up about the compass and um, calibration and that sort of thing. So today is going to kind of be a, a why, how, where, when, who about this little fella here. The compass on the um, the Phantom 2 Vision or the other um, Phantom range, anything else in the Phantom range that uses this setup. Um, so the first question that seems to crop up actually is, is why? Why why on earth have a compass? Uh, I think people get sort of a bit confused because we've got all this exciting GPS technology in here and, and it all seems very cutting edge and, and, and space age and exciting and, and there's a you know bit of a confusion as to why we need something as old school as a compass. Um, the thing about GPS, of course, is it's very good at telling the telling the aircraft where the whole aircraft is in space, um, and it's even pretty reasonable at telling the aircraft which direction it's moving in. Because obviously, if it's if it knows it was at this point half a second ago and now it's here, it can easily work out which direction it's moving in. Um, the thing it can't do with a GPS is is know what its orientation is. So, is it pointing this way and moving in this direction? Or is it pointing this way and moving in this direction? Because of course the great thing about a quadcopter is it can move in any direction. So it needs a compass in order to be able to tell which way it's pointing. And of course when you do that fantastic phantom thing of just letting go of the sticks uh, and it stays put, it not only needs to correct for its, its location in this way uh, and its height, it also needs to make sure it stays pointing at the thing that you've pointed it out to take a photograph. So that's why it needs a compass. Um, so why do you need to calibrate the compass? Of course, when we say compass, what this is is basically it's detecting the Earth's magnetic field lines. That's what it's doing. And those magnetic field lines can change depending on where you are and what is around you that might cause those to change. So, for example, when you first open up your brand shiny new aircraft that's been shipped all the way from Shenzhen in China, um, which was probably the last time it was powered up to test its circuitry, it, it, it's probably got a view of the world and its magnetic field in China. So it's probably a good idea to, to give it a give it a good good idea of what the magnetic field looks like in your neck of the woods. So that's that's why you would need to calibrate. There are maybe one or two other um, things, but we'll 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 go into that. Um, a bit later on. Okay, how to calibrate. I'm not going to go into this in massive detail. There are loads of very good videos uh, on YouTube where people have actually got the thing powered up and they're showing you the, the light signals. But as a brief summary for those of you who, you know, you need to go and read the manual. Uh, but, you know, you'll be aware that in order to, to put it into calibration mode, you need to be flipping the S1 switch between six and ten times or so. Um, wait till the light signals change. You then need to rotate the aircraft around this axis until you get the next signal. And then you need to rotate it around this axis until you get the next signal. Um, go and look those up. I'm not going to spoon feed you. You really do need to read the manual about this. Um, there are two methods, though. Some people do the kind of, as I've just done, sort of spinning it in place like this. Uh, all the way around, which is fine. I find on a bright day, we do get them in the UK occasionally, on a bright day and at my age, bending down to the ground, I can't actually see what the what the signals are, are doing. So what I actually tend to do these days is I tend to hold it like this, fairly close into me, but, but level, and I spin my whole self around. So that really is a compass dance. And that those two, either of those two actions is what is generally referred to on the forums as the compass dance. It's spinning yourself or the aircraft so that... This little boy here can um, can work out what's going on with the magnetic field lines uh, where you are. So that's how you do it. That's a you know go and read the manual. It will give you the light signal changes and everything else. I'm not going to, as I said before, I don't want to spoon feed you on this one. You need to go and read that and do it properly. Um, okay, this then leads to a biggie. Where should you calibrate? Um, <laughs> I've seen people having problems because they calibrated the compass. Uh, well, here in the kitchen, in their apartment, um, people have done it inside cars because it was cold outside. Uh, yours truly once did it in my very early days with this guy. 
uh, I was far too excited and it was a bit of a cold wind and I calibrated it um, outside, but I used my car to shelter from the wind and the other side of, of me being used as a wind buffer with some metal railings. You know, not a good idea. Um, the bottom line is because this effectively is, is looking at um, uh, magnetic field, uh, anything that can affect it, such as big lumps of metal, are going to potentially cause issues. So you need to calibrate this in a really open area, the middle of a field. Um, you know, you as open as you can, and you want to be as sure, as sure as you can be that there are no big metal pipes underground. There's no reinforced concrete, which obviously has metal in it. There are no uh, drain covers that you're standing close by. Um, you know, pick an, as open an area, a grassy field right in the middle of, and you'll be fine. The only th the other thing I would suggest is that you don't have this close by when you do it, just in case. I know some people just have it on their neck strap and they hang it there, that's fine. Um, personally, I leave it over by the flight case and I also take out any sort of big lump, big bunches of keys or anything and, and get rid of those. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's where I would calibrate. Don't do it in cars, on cars, uh, in your house, um, next to a metal fence because, you know, ferromagnetic substances and, and this guy can cause uh, problems. Okay, um, perhaps the most controversial question, when should you calibrate? There's two definite answers that I can give to that one without, without fail. One, when you first get it home, you've bought it new, you need to calibrate it when you get it, get it home and put it outside in a nice open area because as I said before, it only knows the world according to, to where it was built. So you definitely need to do it before your maiden flight, outside, nice open area, which is where you should be flying anyway. You should be in a nice big open area, not in your backyard or wherever. So go and do that. And um, the other time I think you should always definitely calibrate it is if you have modified your, your vision. See, I've got a Flytrex core, which is not, you know, it's not a, not a big piece of metal or anything, but it's there all the time. And, and so there is a chance that perhaps there's going to be a sort of permanent little, little change caused by that. So if I calibrate, I, I calibrated once I'd fitted that, um, and then this guy could, if, if there was any effect, it's now taken into account. And I shouldn't have any issues with that. The other time that I calibrate is if I've had the top off uh, to go and have a look inside because to get to the to the screws here to get yourself in, you sometimes have to take a screwdriver quite close to this this guy here. And you know, there's a chance that that might uh, do something. It's not powered up, but but I don't think it does any harm. There are some people who, who uh, calibrate before every flight. And there are some people who only calibrate when something big changes, like they, they take it abroad or they drive two or three hours away, or there's a known issue with the site. Maybe the, the underlying rocks are ferrous. I don't know. But there are there are those two schools. Um, I'm not going to get involved in that argument. Um, I'm going to say it's less important when you calibrate than where you're doing it. In other words, if you're certain you're in a really good open area that, that gives you a good calibration, fill your boots as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you're the sort of person who, who only likes to calibrate uh, you know, once in a while or when, when things are looking you know, like they need a, a calibration, then you'll have already done that in, in that good open area. Um, however you choose to do it, what I would suggest everybody does is when you've done a calibration or you 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 uh, flying again in a different site or maybe even every flight in in, in, your, in your location is to pop it up into a hover about 10 foot up in the air above head height just in case close to you and watch it like a hawk if it holds steady and you've got a nice balanced um uh, balanced aircraft i think you'll be absolutely fine if you notice any drifting or any rotating around then i think you need to bring it straight down and you may need to recalibrate or at least check the calibration. Um, and I think that's a good good thing to do um, whenever. So I hope um, I hope that's been useful and answered some of the questions that I that I got. Um, you know, I, I'm very non-technical. So the answers that I gave about why there's a compass, you know, if it involves explanations with formulae and oscilloscopes, you're not going to get it from me. It's definitely beyond my my pay grade. Go and go and go and find out somewhere else. But but um, hopefully that was a. A reasonable basic introduction and uh, you know if you've got the weather happy flying thanks bye